on average, you would expect an autonomy supporting environment to be positive for motivation. It's based around a theory that's called self-determination theory. So, you know, we, 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 we usually want to be autonomous. We want to be um, competent, feel competent, and we want to have feelings of social connectedness. And if all those come together, we're pretty intrinsically motivated. So, but I think in this case where you're saying, you know, could there be a case where somebody wants a bit of direction Yes, absolutely. And maybe people who are depressed, where they're struggling to get up and do things, maybe that's where this direction, you know, within the bounds of being, you know, um, pos positive and, and, and supportive to them. But you could say, okay, this is what we're going to do, guys. Let's, let's, let's get to it. And I, I think that kind of direction which is not very autonomous, could well work. I would like to think it would work early mm. in the process when people are getting started. But as they progress, they become a little bit more autonomous. And I think that would help their intrinsic motivation. But that's just a you know, bit of a guess on my part. Yeah, but I think because we're dealing with depressed people, I think um, that makes more sense than the general population. Well, Stuart, welcome. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, and it's good to see you after a few years. Uh, I'm so pleased that we've we've connected. Um, I think the last time that we were interacting was on Twitter, having a small discussion about who the founder of sports science was, Craig Sharp or Clyde Williams and and others. And and you chimed in about the sort of thirtieth anniversaries of of bases. It's it's. Um, it's, it's important for us all to connect over the years, isn't it? Absolutely. And actually, to look back at some of the history, it's really quite interesting. I, I've taken a little bit of interest in that, particularly in the psychology area, but you could go beyond. And um, yeah, it, it, it is very interesting. And I think it's important for younger scientists coming through to know some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. interesting, isn't it? You were, struck, correct me if I'm wrong, you were part of the team that added the E into bases. Um, yes. The exercise. It was BAS before Sport British Association of Sports yeah. Sciences, and you, yep. you had a squad that came along and, and graffitied an E in the middle, did you? <laughs> yes, there, there was certainly a trend in, in in let's say sport psychology to become sport and exercise psychology, and and although some subfields like biomechanics weren't particularly enthusiastic, I think we could persuade people that exercise was seen as a slightly different domain and and why not uh, add it in and make uh, make it more complete and, and represent really what the field was about so um yeah that that was an interesting uh, exercise uh, in itself um pardon the pun and uh, it seemed to work quite well yeah so so I, i'm sure you're too gracious and humble to recognize but you know being able to be part of a team that put exercise science on the map is, is incredible Perhaps that's a good chance, I mean, just to learn a little bit more about your background for people that don't know. Could you just give the, sure. the listeners a bit of a potted history to you? Yeah, of course, I started out in physical education because that was all you could study as an undergraduate back in the 1970s. And just as I was graduating, sports science type degrees were springing up. Um, but then I did a master's in sports psychology and a PhD in psychology psychology of sport of course um and got into lecturing and I've, I've been as a lecturer researcher through to professor all of my career and I kind of morphed from yeah doing not just psychology but health and fitness and a bit of strength and conditioning um and then obviously focus more on psychology particularly exercise and health and then you could say my final part of my career um, broadened out to look at what I used to say was the bigger picture. So a lot of influences on why people might be physically active, why they might not be active, 
Um, and that requires more than just psychology. I even had to learn a bit of um, physiology, dare I say, oh. and uh, epidemiology and work with people who were looking at particular biomarkers in trials and things like that, where I was in charge of the behavior change element. So that was great. I really enjoyed that broadening out, looking at the bigger picture and becoming a bit more of a public health specialist rather than just a psychologist. Mm. I mean, that, that, that might touch on the complexities of of why people do physical activity and the necessity to to broaden. But did that initial initial sort of breadth, strength and conditioning, and um, and so on, did that help you later in your career? You know, that sort of initial start, perhaps more generalist. Did that did that help you now? I think it did. Now. You know, a lot of young people coming into the profession now want to specialize and maybe universities and other institutions, not just universities, of course, want you to specialize and want you to be the expert. But mm -hmm. I learned a lot by doing, first of all, teaching a lot, teaching many different courses and yeah, getting my hands dirty, so to speak, doing strength and conditioning and um, coaching uh mm. so uh, yeah personally i think it did because i i could relate to some of the practical um nuances and the practical realities of of, of working in the field um whether that works today uh, i don't know uh, i'd like to think people would get a little bit of broad experience yeah mm. yeah i think it i think almost at recruitment it, it we we're, we're sort of probably culpable of of looking for the specialists, the people dedicated in that lane, mm. strength conditioning coaches mm. from birth, uh, nutritionists from birth, when actually that helps them perhaps in the initial stages of a career, but it doesn't help them when they're interacting with a multidisciplinary mm. team. And yeah. their solution is not necessarily the solution. It has to yeah. be a, an amalgam of different, different options and different uh, yeah. approaches. Yeah. Well, I think mentioning that multidisciplinary team is key and and that that is something we didn't do very well early in my career. Um, I'm not even sure we use the term. We tended to be in our own little silos. And, and whilst that still happens, I think we've got a lot better at coming together and, and talking in these more diverse teams. And, and that's essential, of course. Mm. Now, looking down your list of publications, um, I mean, it's, you have to scroll. You have to ask Google Scholar to show more <laughs> several times. It's a tour de force. Um, and, but I, I reached out to you specifically about a paper that you, you're a, a co-author on. Um, and it's really just an excuse just to, just to pick your brain and just to tap into your knowledge base, really. But I, I can see that flavor of different um, approaches. There's, this, this one on here about uh, family correlates of fruit and vegetables consumption. I, I, you know, and maybe I'll pick your brains on that one too. Um, but if I could, if I could start off with this this particular paper, and just if if I could ask you to to help me understand and maybe unpack some of the the bigger findings. So yeah. just to introduce it for people. The, the, and I'll put the, the link into the, the notes so people can go and have a look for themselves. Um, first author, Michael Notel, is that right? Yep. Yeah, he's local to here. He's at University of Queensland. I'm at University okay. of Southern Queensland. Uh, so Mike is uh, a terrific academic. And Mike, Mike had this idea to, to pull together, uh, obviously, a number of studies. It's a systematic review, a meta-analysis. Um, well, let me just backtrack. Uh, okay, mm. so this is on exercise and depression. And exercise and depression, or depression, I should say, is probably one of the most studied areas within what you might call exercise psychology. Um, because it was, pr depression was probably the first outcome that people got interested in. Um, lots of studies out there, lots of systematic reviews, some better than others, of course. 
And it's been interesting because uh, I hope I'm not sort of going off off track. No, no, no. um, You know, there have been a number of quite big systematic reviews, quite high profile journals, British Medical Journal, which ours was in, but there was a British Medical Journal paper on the similar topic 10, it might be more actually, 20 years ago. Um, And they get criticized because the quality of the individual studies that goes into the meta-analysis is usually quite low. Uh, It's not to say they're bad studies. It's just quite difficult to control for a lot of factors in these studies. And, And so you might get a strong effect. Exercises, you know, if, if it's in a trial context, produces quite strong effects in changing depression, but the studies get rated at a, uh, well, what we call higher risk of bias or, or lower quality of study. And so if you're a little bit hard nosed, you would say, well, you know, it's, it's a big effect size, but what, you know, it doesn't really matter because they're all weak studies or they've got high risk of bias. So your confidence in drawing conclusions is, is, is diminished. Mm. Okay, fair enough. Um, but, you know, sometimes we judge these studies by standards that are not always possible when you're doing field-based exercise studies. So they may not be quite as um, biased or, or, or weak as, as sometimes we think. Anyway, let, let's come back to the topic. So uh, uh, depression has a, a long history in, in, in this field. And there's still stuff coming out. And what we tried to do in this study was also to look, uh, or particularly to look at not just did exercise affect depression. I think we pretty much know that. Um, the, the findings are pretty robust, despite a few skeptics out there. Um, but to say, well, are there different activities that might have more beneficial effect than others? And I have to admit, I've never really bought into that in the past, because I think it can be quite individual. You might say you love swimming. I might say I don't like swimming. So where are your mental health benefits going to come from if I don't like swimming? It's going to be a bit of drudgery. I might get something, but it might not be as good as if I was to say, well, I love walking. And you might say, oh, I'm bored by walking. I like to do something else. So it's kind of horses for courses. And uh, that, that was my belief anyway, that, you know, I, I'm not, I wasn't convinced we were going to get much in, in the way of results, but we did. And, um, you, you know, you can look at certain uh, activities. Of course, some don't have many studies. That's the problem. Um, I mean, dance type activities actually came out quite strongly in our review, but uh, the number of studies and the number of robust studies wasn't particularly high. So you've got to be pretty cautious. Mm. Um, but just anyway, that was the general then, gist. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that, does, that, does that approach that you've thought about leading into this area, is that informed by as much adherence, um, uptake, yeah. do what you enjoy? Uh, approach. Yes, exactly. and I, I think that the, the, as a physiologist, I'm asked, what's the best exercise? I've heard triathlons are great. I've heard swimming is all round body exercise. Yeah. I heard running's good yeah. for your bones. And so there's this sort of, there's a temp, an attempt to, to rank and, um, and rate the different types of exercise. And and I was struck by an executive I was working with, and, and I was talking about cross training and, and and walking and all these sort of things. She said, you know what? I used to dance. I used to really dance well. And I was like, do that, do that then, if that's what you love. She said, I, I would absolutely love it. And that sense of enjoyment, um, either in anticipation, during the social connections and afterwards, just struck me as the the ideal solution and from ever ever since then i've i've had that type of conversation people yeah. people have asked me and i say well what do you enjoy uh, what have you done before so that there's more of a a fertile ground that that people can build a habit on so i mean you're absolutely right and uh, you know we can look at this from a so you know way back it was sort of thinking well 
exercise is exercise, physical activity is physical activity, that will produce depression reduction, positive depression effects. Um, you know, it, and then it's a matter of, well, how hard should the exercise be? How long should it be? Well, all that is important, you know, and does it have to improve your fitness or can you just be physically active without necessarily shifting your fitness levels too much? All that's important, but when it comes down to it, it's what you just said. I think there's a much stronger interplay between the biology of energy expenditure, and I think energy expenditure is really important here, um, with the sort of psychosocial. So if dance, for example, comes out as generally a pretty positive form of physical activity, notwithstanding the fact there were rather few studies and few high quality studies, um, you know, well, why is that? Well, it is probably a strong psychosocial element. Maybe the music comes into it as well. But um, it's quite different from somebody going out running on their own without any, let's say, music, just running. Now, some people are going to love that. You know, we, we, we've we known from the past, we've been associated with runners who are just, just, just lap it up, you know, but others will find that much more difficult and therefore the mental health effects won't be quite so obvious. So as I say, it's going to be horses for courses. It's going to be very much individualized. But, you know, there are some trends, there's certain activities that seem to maybe boost and enable the mental health benefits at the same time. Mm, yeah, interesting. And so the the work, the title of the work, Effect of Exercise for Depression, Systematic Review and Network Meta-Analysis of Randomized Control Trials. Um, so you've got a good squad of authors who've collaborated on this 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 study. Um, what's the, so I think maybe you've answered this question, but what's the problem that the paper is trying to resolve? Is it finding clarity well, amongst a myriad of interventions? Yeah, there's definitely that. I mean, you know, a lot, there are a lot of reviews out there, as I've said, a lot of meta-analyses. So what's ours adding? Well, first of all, you're updating. It's the most up-to-date. Um, it's on trials, randomized controlled trials, so-called gold standard of research design. Um, we're also trying to look at interconnectedness between types of activities and types of studies and seeing whether they hold together. That's the network part of it. So there are a number of things, probably the most, well, at least to those who are reading it from a relatively lay perspective or non-specialist perspective is to say, well, are there clusters of activities, types of activities that, that might have um, better mental health effects or anti-depression effects than, than others? Um, and and uh, let me just highlight one interesting one, and it, it is an interest of mine that's been in the last few years. So sort of yoga, and, and those kind of activities, which are interesting because they came out quite well. Um, some would say, oh, yoga, it's not really that vigorous. You know, you don't sort of get fit doing yoga. Well, eh, that's debatable. There are some yoga poses that are extremely demanding. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it's a relatively calm um you know, it's basically around poses rather than vigorous activity. We know that. Um, but it does also integrate a little bit of mind-body functioning, doesn't it? So parts of a yoga session, if people listening to this are not so familiar, you know, will include some relaxation, some breathing, some thought processes, deliberate thought processes. And, you know, maybe that's creating the antidepressant effect and not just the physical movement so we have this i wouldn't say it's a dilemma but it, we have this issue that you know what is it that's causing antidepressant effects and to, to what extent is it the physical movement and to what extent is it the, the is is it something else i mean could you get the same effects for example playing chess or could you get the same effects reading a book well yes you could um, so it's not just the physical movement. On the other hand, physical movement can be extremely beneficial and can have its own effects, you know, in in their own right. Right. So a combination but, of, of 
not just necessarily the physical activity, but what it requires of you, what it prompts you to do, what it it's maybe it also stops you from doing. Um, as you allude to the dance, un unless you're boogieing in your living room on your own, maybe just dance on the Wii or something, assume that's going to be, you're going to be dancing with people, the Zumba yeah. type effect that I, th I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you make a similar sort of connection between walking, walking, and so perhaps the supplementary effect of, of being in nature, assuming you're not going to yeah. be in a garage on a treadmill, <clears throat> that there is an additional component of that. We need to sort of try and hatch something yeah. where you're doing a walk dance in nature with uh, with the opportunity to stop and pose. <laughs> it's an amalgam there. <laughs> I mean, but you've hit the nail on the head in the sense, okay, so we just uh, go back to this idea of enjoyment. And, you know, you, you, you get mental health benefits because you're, you're involved with an activity you're enjoying. I might say a bit more about that in a minute, depending where we go. But my question is, what is it you're enjoying? And it might be the music, it might be the social, it might be some skill element. I mean, I like to play a bit of golf, um, and it's probably a bit of all of those. You're out in nature. Um, I'm with some friends. We have a good social rapport. It's a skill challenge, and that that kind of is interesting. So, um, whereas my yoga, and I do I do go to yoga classes. Um, yeah, maybe it's a bit of that. It's less the social for me in yoga and more to do with the physical and mental integration. So all I'm saying is the, you know, yes, we want to enjoy it, but what, what is it you're enjoying? Um, you know, I, so I can walk from the house. I'm in my house now. I can walk from my house. Um, I live in an area which has some man-made lakes, person-made lakes, and uh, they're great. Uh, they're, they're very attractive and they're just about the right distance for me to walk. Uh, now, would I do the same if it was just around a bunch of houses or, or, or mm. uh, more commercial area? Probably not. But I love this walk uh, around the lake. So again, the nature element. So what is it that drives us? What is it that reinforces us and what makes us come back? And, and then the mental health effects of just the exercise, but also the exercise plus that's that's what we're probably after that that makes me uh yeah. recall a conversation with costas Car Georgius on the mm. on the podcast mm. um mm. and and one of the components that he he referred to was sort of the hedonistic effect mm. of 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 how you leave an exercise session whether an exercise class the hedonism of that and how how music can facilitate the the memory that you leave the exercise with, as opposed to necessarily what happens during, it's how you remember it, how it finishes, uh, that he was particularly interested in. And, and that, that seems to connect a little bit there, what you're saying, that, that what's the enjoyment aspect, as opposed to what are the physical manifestations, whether that is bone health or, or blood pressure reduction later in the day, or dopamine, whatever it might be. Mm. Yeah, that's good. I mean, Costa's done some great work on this with music and sport and exercise. And um, we also know, by the way, that a lot of the um, you can pretty much be guaranteed that when somebody finishes an exercise session of whatever type, um, their positive feelings, their feeling states increase. You know, so post-exercise, we do have that feel-good effect. You may not necessarily have that during exercise. That very much depends what, what you do. For example, if you do something particularly strenuous, um, it might be quite tough. You still might feel good at the end, but just for a bit in the middle, you might be having some, you know, uh, challenges. Um so yeah, I think this might relate to what Costas is is, is saying, and, and the post exercise rise in positive affect. It's quite important. Yeah. And so the the big findings, if I'm not mistaken, that exercise interventions are comparable to psychotherapy, and exercise right. is stronger than pharmacology. 
mm. as a, as an intervention for depression. Mm. Yeah, this is, I mean, some people think, oh, that's a bit strong, isn't it? Um, but actually, that's been found in the past as well. And people have, now, for, for very severe forms of depression, you know, we're not saying forget medication, just go for a run. That would be irresponsible. Medication is very important for some people, particularly at the higher end of levels of depression. But for those with more mild forms of depression, um, it can either be an adjunct, so the two can go together, psychother uh, well, psychotherapy and pharmacological uh, interventions alongside physical activity and exercise. And in some cases, just, just exercise. And again, if I just digress slightly, so um, back in my days at Loughborough, I had a fantastic PhD student in Guy Faulkner, and Guy is now a senior professor in Canada, University of British Columbia. Excellent track record in a number of areas of physical activity. But he had an initial interest in mental health, and he did a very interesting study where he interviewed directors of clinical psychology programs in the UK, clinical psychology training programs, and asked them about the role of exercise in mental health and he got quite sort of skeptical come um i'm not quite sure what the word is but they were saying oh, you know it, it needs more than exercise you can't just cure somebody of depression just by asking them to go for a run it's it's and now there was a bit of self-serving bias in there i think that the d directors had to justify their role as clinical psychologists and maybe that's being a bit unkind but you know um w we've never said it's just exercise but it can sit alongside psychotherapy and and some people call it exercise is psychotherapy um and it can sit alongside the 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 the, the more um you know drug based um I interventions so it's actually not such a, pr a surprising finding from from our meta analysis because it has been found in the past it comes out very well against these alternatives which of course from a cost effectiveness point of view is really important because exercise is usually pretty cost effective so there's, there's something that's that's occurring to me here, and, and it, it is something I encounter in some conversations with people. I'm talking to, about types of exercise that, that they might want to, to take up for fitness purposes. But increasingly with for people, perhaps even like elite coaches, who are actually surrounded by this, this high-intensity environment, but also extensive training programs, and then neglecting their health. Um, and, and again, they, they, they veer to what, what should I do when actually the, the solution might not necessarily be the, the weight loss intervention or the, um, the structured running program. It might actually be something that, that helps their mental health generally, perhaps not from a, a, a depressive end of the continuum but certainly helping them cope and manage. Um, and I've had a similar response to, to suggestions to go for a walk. <laughs> um, and it almost feels like it belittles the, mm. the suggestion of, mm. you know, when, when, you know, there's a sent, there's a sentence in the study about, you know, we hypothesize, hypothesize that a combination of social interaction, mindfulness, experiential acceptance, increased self-efficacy, immersion in green spaces, neurobiological mechanisms, and acute positive effect combined to generate outcomes. But if you just wrap it up with, just go for a walk, mate. <laughs> it does, That's right. It sort of, yeah. it makes them go, is that it? Is that the whole that, that was the reflection <laughs> from those clinical psychology directors. That that was, I was struggling to find the words to explain it, but that's exactly right. Yeah, it, it, it's too simple, right? It, yeah. it, and it belittle, belittles it. It, it, it uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to try and record that sentence uh, from the study. And I'm going to try and replay that. And if I if I'm thinking about social interaction, connection with nature, neurobiological, my my best suggestion is to perambulate 
in nature or something like that. I'm going to try and sort of dress <laughs> up so it doesn't just sound like just 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 to well, go for some strides. <laughs> Of, of, of course, what it does tell us is is it is multifaceted, and um, you know actually you were saying earlier that um, you know getting out in nature, for example, is a great way to to get the benefits of both physical activity and mental health. Um, I've I've I actually um, when I was working at Loughborough, my house had a I put a treadmill in the back of the garage and it was a low ceiling. It was a bit dark. It was pretty grotty area, and I used to go on the treadmill, um, and maybe because I had different motives, I, I had um, I had some music on for sure, and that to me was sufficient, given the limitations of where I was. Uh, to get some mental health and physical benefits. Um, so it very much depends on the individual, but it, it's multifaceted. So yeah, you could do green space, you could do social stuff, you could do mind body, whatever. Um, but you don't have to do them all at once. And uh, you, you, you take what works for you, basically. And so you're looking at effect sizes. You mentioned that dance came out well, mm. and walking mm. and jogging. But what's interesting mm. that and you, you couch this in the paper nicely, um, but I'd love to get your interpretation. Strength training seemed to be mm. s slightly more effective for depression mm. for women and yoga and Qigong type mm. exercises more effective for men. That was an mm. interesting, almost perhaps maybe counterintuitive yeah. to the stereotypes yeah. that we parrot. Um, what's your sense there? Yeah, I'm not, yes, it, it, you're absolutely right. And um, I'm not sure I've got a very clear um, answer to that. I do think, by the way, that strength training, and, and we know that, you know, whatever we want to call it, strength training, muscle strength exercise, resistance exercise, all that stuff has become much more in the um, public eye for public health um it's it's more prominent it's more in national guidelines now and so on now what's that got to do with your your question about you know gender differences i don't know i honestly don't know maybe more women now are doing that stuff and getting more benefit i don't know um but you know i think it's going to be a more prominent form of exercise than it has been in the past and I know from my own personal experience, this is a you know terrible sort of just an anecdote, end of one. Um, I, I used to get very positive and quite rapid feel-good effects from muscle strengthening exercise. You know, there's very much a physical um, feedback about muscles contracting and and you know you can feel the muscles working and so on. And and when you finish that, it, it, there's a great sense of satisfaction so maybe it's that but no the gender or the sex differences i can't honestly explain very very clearly and that therefore that's something we must continue to look at mm. uh, be it be an in interesting one the mm. yoga and the tai chi may may be the the uh, the the opposite that men you know have never well not the opposite actually it's a similar issue that the men are generally underrepresented in those groups Right. I maybe see. you're getting a certain maybe you're getting a certain type of individual who goes to those sessions. Um, I don't know. They're, they're they're plausible, but they're they're things we have to look at. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's um it's not for me to to freestyle on it, but it, it just struck me as that sort of counterintuitive of it. Mm. It's almost that sort of questioning of about wondering what's missing physiologically or what's mm. dampened physiologically in depressive states. Um, but actually the strength training from a, say, um, anabolic hormones point of view, bo boosting mm -hmm. some of those areas when actually the yoga and Tai Chi and others might be sort of calming some of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just, it was just yeah. interesting for, for as, a, as a finding that it wasn't necessarily consistent. It was actually polar and opposite. Yeah. 
and you know you do get this in some of these studies and um you, you're trying to pull together not that large a number of studies some of which are stronger than, than others etc cetera, etc cetera, and diverse samples so these are trends the, these are interesting trends, but they are, are not sure we're at a point where we can fully explain them. And, um, you know, the, the, it's a trigger for somebody to come along and say, right, here, there's an interesting point. Let's go and have a look at that in a, in a bit more detail, see if we can um, uh, progress uh, our understanding of, in this case, um, sex differences. So, yeah, it's, no, it's, it's, a, mm. it's an interesting one. And I'm not sure I can fully explain yeah. them my, myself, which, of course, is is you know, normal in academia, you, you, you can't fully explain all your results and you have to move on and, and, and try to progress it from there. Well, let, let me try another one if I can from the paper, but, mm. but, but the vigorous exercise seemed to perform a little yeah. bit better. Um, mm. Yeah. And what was in, what occurred to me when I was reading that was, it was just that sense of, um, and do do excuse me and tell me off if I've got if if I've phrased this wrong because um, you should. Is there a risk that perhaps depressive states would lead to less willingness to engage in something that requires high motivation, perhaps as opposed to a walk, which is there's a low barrier to entry, there's low f friction there, but right, you're doing a high intensity interval session on a bike. <laughs> in a class that that's going to require you to get up for it um yeah it, no it, you're not saying anything stupid at all in fact you've absolutely hit a very important point and um and, and exactly that 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 people who are depressed are will find it difficult to do these or difficult to get started to do these things that's part of being depressed so um, now, maybe that introduces a bias into some of these studies, that these studies are the ones that we've recruited people into, and they've been, uh, not cajoled, right. but you know what I mean, you know, they've been they, encouraged. They've shown willingness, and, uh, this yeah, is an shown willingness to program. be there. Are you up for it? Exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah, so right. you've got a certain type of person, they react positively to that. I would say, though... Um, Okay, so so just on that point, you know, so if you can get them in the sessions, you normally have some pretty positive effects. But yes, the challenge is, can we get them into the sessions in the first place? And and that is a behavioral challenge that we still have in, in this area. Um, uh, by the way, something quickly comes into my head is I did hear a lecture by a forensic psychologist working at the Rampton Hospital, not too far from, well, in the in the Midlands, uh, in the UK, um, high secure, very demanding patients, and they had great success in a number of changes to health behaviours in terms of diet, smoking, physical activity, and so on. And these are now these are not just depressed individuals. They have a number of quite challenging psychological conditions, but they managed to get them involved. And um, I won't go through. Well, I probably don't understand all what they did, but from what I gathered, they they had some quite a lot of success in in getting those behaviour behavior change to occur so it can be done but yes it's challenging to get depressed people um you know to put a, a foot out of the door as they say mm. so you know i think that that's a really uh really important point if if i can come back to the issue of intensity it doesn't surprise me that slightly higher levels of intensity um stimulate more than lower levels of intensity. I mean, they do physiologically, obviously. And I think psychologically, they can do up to a point. I've been a bit um, unpopular among certain <laughs> groups of researchers who are I big into high you're intensity. Unpopular, and, and it's, it's, your, it's your thoughts and opinions that might stir the pot. Okay, maybe that's, that's a good way of putting it. But, you know, I said that, you know, hit type training sessions were not relevant for public health. I just didn't think enough people would do them. That's all I'm saying. They're, they're tough, you know, and would we get people to adhere to them over a long period of time? And people didn't like me saying that because, you know, HIT was flavor of the month and, and so on and so forth. But what I'm saying is that, you know, we do know that high levels of intensity can be challenging 
Um, and during exercise can produce actually negative psychological states, but afterwards can produce positive psychological states. So it's a matter of whether people are willing to put up with the negative and the and the and the challenge to get the reward at the end. And um, now it depends on the level of intensity, of course. Some people will do a little bit more than before, and it's not really that intense, but it's a bit more, and get a lot of positives out of that. So that's probably what we're finding with uh, with, with with those results is, um, you know, people are liking the challenge a bit, and they're feeling that they've got through this challenge, and they feel good about that. And and of course, they're probably improving their fitness a bit more, and that makes you feel good. So mm. why wouldn't slightly higher intensity, as I say, up to a point, have that benefit? So this, that's the way this, I see it's it. Got my, it's got my um, programming mind going in, in the sense that if if I was to suggest to an athlete that they, they needed to address a certain component of their physiology, um, mm. and what, what I wouldn't necessarily do is suggest to a coach, let's supplement this interval set at a certain intensity. We wouldn't supplement that in. We wouldn't sort of chop something out from a program to make space for it. I would try and get them to grow that session up. So that could be rather than say, uh a thursday one hour run that it's a thursday one hour run with five minutes at a slightly elevated pace the mm -hmm. following week it's it's two lots of five minutes and it's growing that up um mm -hmm. and it, it was almost just occurring to me that that if you if you got them in to do an exercise session um you could sneak an interval in <laughs> and then the following week you could sneak another one but ultimately that's how we would rehab uh, an injury as well that's how we would progress a certain fitness component and i'm just curious as to whether any of these exercise interventions have taken a, a a progressive overload where you're actually trying to not only grow the volume but grow the blend of intensities that people mm. are using mm. Mm. I don't know is is the simple answer, um, but what you just said makes makes a lot of sense. Uh, um, but I think what we do know from um, to, just to simplify it, it, the relationship between exercise intensity and affective response is um, you know at those very high levels um, is is generally negative. You know, pe people find it unpleasant. Um, not not th not forever, because when they finish, they get that rebound effect. Mm -hmm. and they feel good, but you know. So the key point is here. I think for exercise adherence, we think it's it's best predicted by how you feel during exercise. Right. So if you feel pretty, you know, you don't feel great during the exercise, it's too hard, that's probably going to predict a lack of adherence. Mm. doesn't matter how good physiologically it is for you, that's probably what's going to happen. So it's this kind of roundabout way of addressing what you're, what, what you're saying. And, and that's, mm. that was my argument against some of the hit claims um about you know it, it being the best thing since sliced bread well nobody's actually said that but you know that they they were claiming this was a wonderful thing for everybody and i was saying well hang on a minute some people are going to find it too tough and therefore not like it and therefore drop out and, and that that was the argument mm, yeah well I, I, it does make me wonder whether you from from a physiological point of view you could you could get the intensity, but without the distress. Um, there's, oh, there's ways in which you could one. potentially do that okay. um, with short bursts that yeah. that demand intensity and blood flow and heart to work hard, yeah. but not accumulation yeah. of metabolic end products. But okay. that's, um, well, that's an interesting one. I wonder whether that's somewhat similar to exercise breaks. And um, for example, if I walk into the building where I, where I'm work at the university and walk up the stairs to the third level it's quite demanding if they're quite steep 
the stairs and it's quite high it only takes me 30 45 seconds something like that people say oh you bet it's take you know that's a five minute workout on that one i know it's not it's about 30 seconds it feels but like it is quite minutes. that's the <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, but it is quite vigorous it mm. is quite vigorous now then it then the issue is well how often would i have to do it breaking up my day is that good is it bad anyway so yeah these kind of things mm. need to be looked at and the whole area of exercise breaks is an interesting one and that, that's certainly possible now another another comment in here around autonomy was interesting mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i'm wondering whether there's some applicability here to for coaches um or physical education teachers who, mm -hmm. who might have a range of of people who are highly motivated highly motivated um through to not that bothered through to actually i'm not that not that well um in their class but also in their sports space group mm. so my understanding is that offering choices mm. invitational language sort of here's here's your options you choose mm. um that that actually weakened the effects on depression when actually a little bit more direction of do this <laughs> don't have to think about it seem to actually strengthen them is that is that right so it's counter that is counterintuitive to well it, yes and no it's counterintuitive so let, let me say a couple of things on this so one is that on average you would expect an autonomy supporting environment to be positive for motivation it's based around a theory that's called self-determination theory so you know we 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 usually want to be autonomous we want to be um, competent, feel competent, and we want to have feelings of social connectedness. And if all those come together, we're pretty intrinsically motivated. So, but I think in this case where you're saying, you know, could there be a case where somebody wants a bit of direction? Yes, absolutely. And maybe people who are depressed, where they're struggling to get up and do things maybe that's where this direction you know within the bounds of being you know um pos positive and, and and supportive to them but you could say okay this is what we're going to do guys let's 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 get to it and i i think that kind of direction which is not very autonomous could well work i would like to think it would work early mm. in the process when people are getting started but as they progress, they become a little bit more autonomous. And I think that would help their intrinsic motivation. But that's just a you know, bit of a guess on my part. Yeah, but I think because we're dealing with depressed people, I think um, that makes more sense than the general population. So lead people to start off with um, mm. rather than, hey, it's up to you. It's a free space yeah. for you to fill. Well, actually, that might... Yeah require adding to decision making load or yeah. I, I don't know because i don't know myself or i'm uncertain absolutely right and i've had this in the past where you know somebody you think you're doing them a favor by giving them lots of choices but actually they come back to you and say sorry i'm a bit overwhelmed by all this i don't really know what to do can you just tell me can you just or at least steer me towards something Mm. and uh then they pick it up from there it's interesting it's not a million miles away from um some of the motivational elements of starting an exercise program versus continuing it or maintenance of exercise we, we're very bad at understanding maintenance actually and years <laughs> excuse me years ago somebody said you know we're, we're likely to start doing exercise for reasons of health so it's quite sort of instrumental and it's quite directive you know i'm going to do this to lose weight i'm going to do this to um you know reduce my heart disease risk or whatever but once they get going in exercise it tends to be much more affective and driven by enjoyment as we spoke about earlier and 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 maybe that's not too dissimilar to what we're saying about you know being quite directive early on and then they become a bit more autonomous as as they go through and, and look to maintain involvement 
just a thought. Is is there a yeah. is there a requirement there to transition from a state of thinking about I'm I'm exercising, um, I'm trying to exercise. There's an effortful sort of statement there through to I'm an exerciser and being oh, part yeah. of of someone's identity as opposed to something they're forced to do as opposed to maybe like a rule it's it's part of me and so i do this yes absolutely right you know what steve you, you've missed your uh, calling in life you should have been a psychologist you, we should have been a strength coach Stuart. you should have, you should have. <laughs> we, we we should have gone that way but that, that, that's a great point and i think exercise identity or you know, identity as a physically active person is is absolutely right, and you you identify with it, and that's also part of this theory, this self determination theory. You 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 take in and you you um, you digest that kind of philosophy, and that's part of you, rather than being told to do something and you feel guilty if you don't. You've not really taken on board that that. Whereas if you take it on board and you say, "Yeah, this is me. I'm an exerciser. I identify in that way, and I want to do it. Not that I have to do it." This have versus want is really important, and it's true in lots of areas of life. You know, I want to do it rather than I have to do it. If you can get that transition to the want, you 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 you're half well, more than halfway there. Mm. You know? Yeah. And, and yeah. so are the guidelines of 150 to 300 minutes of moderate <laughs> activity, 75 to 150 of vigorous activity, are they overly intimidating to start? Um, mm. I mean, that's a sudden, mm. a sudden increase. Um, that would feel quite overwhelming for people. Is there a... Yeah. Some people say people, it is. Uh, if you're starting yeah. out, here's how to, yeah. you know, maybe consistency yeah. is 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 more important than volume in that sense. Yeah. yeah. So first of all, I mean, this is really interesting. I, I'm I'm right in the thick of uh, guideline work right now. The Australians are updating their adult and older adult guidelines for physical activity, sedentary behaviour. I'm, I'm looking at a file right on my desk here <laughs> full mm. of all sorts of stuff i need to do i was also involved with the who guidelines and you know these are essentially health related guidelines this is what you need to do to optimize your health it has um they were not written to say how right. can we get more people to be physically active okay although obviously we want to to get there eventually so going back to your point about you know is is it too intimidating is it too too much to get started absolutely could be the case for a lot of people to be fair who and a lot of other guidelines have that little caveat in there that says you know start start small build up uh, anything is better than nothing all of that kind of stuff and so even if you don't get anywhere near 150 to 300, if you're doing something and you're doing more than you were doing before, you're making progress. Mm. Um, and that's the, the kind of balancing act that guidelines people have. You know, governments want clear guidelines. They want numbers. They want minutes. But um, we know that the reality is that, that that's, it, there's a lot more to it than that. Hmm. So guidelines are interesting from that point of view. Right, well, that's, that's interesting. That that just doesn't seep out into the ether as much that something is better than nothing, because that is a very yeah. powerful statement. Yeah. Something yeah. every a little bit every day that yeah. feels a bit like uh, to draw a crass parallel: the ten thousand hours versus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm probably I'd probably frame this: is if you wanted to market your piano learning lessons. Or, or learning a language, you'd say, follow my course, it's five minutes a day, yes. rather than you've got to do 10,000 hours. Um, yes. And it make people go, oh, you know what, I'm not going to bother. Um, because I, that, that so feels true. insurmountable. Take so the first true. few steps up the mountain rather than look at the peak. Yeah. So true. Yeah, yeah. And 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 uh, to be fair again to guidelines, that it's a it's about optimizing health at a public health level. And uh, later on, guidelines get disseminated and, and and cascaded down to different groups who then try to apply it to 
behavior change and to different target groups and so on. And they may change the actual numbers. They may they may take the sort of more is better approach rather than 150 to 300 minutes. But um, yeah, it's an interesting uh, conversation, I think, of always around guidelines. Yeah. So, so we're probably talking a lot about poking and prodding and motivating and cajoling, mm -hmm. inspiring people to, to do activity. But the at least on your the first page of your uh, mm -hmm. reference list is this article about fruit and veg consumption. I'll ask you before <laughs> before you go. And so I haven't delved into the, the paper, but the headline, it seems as though a child's fruit and veg consumption is related to the adults from a role modeling point of view. Um, discuss and please can expand if there's a similar thing around <clears throat> similar thing around physical activity. Mm. You put me slightly on the spot because I haven't seen that okay. paper for a long time. And it, <laughs> it was it was beautifully led by my Loughborough colleague Natalie Pearson. But um no, I mean okay, so first of all, we you know we've always been interested in health behaviors and health behavior change. And, we're, and okay, we've done 99% of our work in, or not 90% of our work in physical activity, but there are these other behaviors that, that are equally uh, interesting, diet, of course, being one. And as far as the sort of healthy diet's concerned, there's a key, you know, key component is to try to, to shift fruit and vegetable consumption, just as one, one component, of course. And yeah, I think so what you tend to find, and this is true to a certain extent of sedentary behaviors and physically active behaviors, is the the modeling effect and the social contagion effect of, in this case, parents with children. And don't forget, in terms of diet, parents basically provide the diet, right? Mm. Certainly the in the home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they do the shopping, Choices they do the, the cooking. Yeah. You know, so what are they going to eat? They're going to eat what their parents uh, prepare for them. And um, I used to find with my children, again, sorry, anecdote N of one, um, if I cut up the fruit, they would eat it. But if I gave them a bit of fruit that required cutting up, oh, it's too much effort. So, you know, making it available, making it palatable, um, like, you know, cutting it up, obviously, they got to like the type of fruit that you or vegetable that you're providing. So, you know, the same determinants of dietary patterns can be found in, in, in physical activity, providing the right social environment, the right physical environment, providing the right conversation, if you like, uh, around um, behavior change and so on. So, yeah, I find that kind of interesting. I haven't done a lot of work in that area, to be honest, mm. but it is pretty interesting. Um, and, and, I, I, yeah. I have a memory of Neil Armstrong, and for people who are listening, this is the paediatric yes, <laughs> physiologist, not the, astronaut. Not, not, not the <laughs> as I'm sure he's pained yeah. to, to explain yes. throughout his life, yes. um, putting a, an overhead up at a Basie's workshop in it must have been 1998 about physical activity, and he put a correlation between um, body composition of the pet dog and the <laughs> owner. And I've, I've asked Neil since, and I've asked Craig Williams and they haven't, they don't remember it, but I remember, I, I remember it because it was so stark, but it, now I haven't been able to dig that out or not, but whether that is, that follows ultimately, if you're not walking your dog very much, <laughs> that dog's going to put on a few, few pounds. Um, I mean, th there was a burst of activity in research on dog walking about five years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, um, where having a dog was, and I'm sure the, the trend is still true, but not many people seem to be studying it anymore. Um, having a dog was extremely beneficial. It got people walking. There's no doubt about it. Um, now, which members of the family walk it is 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 another question, and of course it goes back to our, our wonderful you know his history of um, Per Olaf Ostrand or Ustrand, um, you know who who always said that didn't he? You know always take your dog for a walk even if you haven't got one. That was the most wonderful <laughs> phrase I ever I ever heard. He was such a wonderful presenter and. Um, so there, there. I mean, to put a sort of academic hat on to explain this, there is your sort of environmental prompt. 
Yes. You have a dog and the dogs have to be walked. You can't just, unless you've got a massive farm, you can't just let them loose. You go for a walk. And it's a wonderful prompt. And uh, Neil was probably right. Even if it wasn't backed up by science, it was mm. at the time, you know, it's probably just a bit of a guess, but it was a good guess. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> wonderful. Look, I mean, it's, it's, it's so interesting to hear your big insights. What, what's left? for you what's what's um what's driving you what are you working on that that you want to work on before you hang up your um i don't know what you hang up when you're a, if you're yeah. a, a physical activity psychologist maybe uh oh, yeah. i don't know an rpe child well, i've I moved I, uh, yeah no it's a good question I, i've moved from full-time to part-time uh i work part-time now um i'm nearly 70 and i could yeah, hang up my boots or whatever the metaphorical equivalent is. Um, I enjoy doing what I do and I, I supervise students. I got one working on mental health and green space and blue space um, in Australia. Um, I, I've always enjoyed uh, supervising. We have a grant with another university on uh, trying to get a better understanding of how to set goals for physical activity. We've got a one of my colleagues who's leading this has got a, some nice ideas that challenge rather traditional views about goal setting so that's quite practical and, and important theoretically as well i i'll just keep doing this stuff as as and when i still do a lot of stuff on sedentary behavior screen screen use in young children now right. we've done a lot of interviews with parents because screens have changed a lot. It's not just TV and computers now. It's all, obviously, we know it's the mobile devices and 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 even watches and, and so on. So I'm still very interested in that because that stemmed out of my interest in sedentary lifestyles, too much TV viewing, too much screen use, whatever. But now it's become much broader. What are the positives and negatives uh, beyond just the physical? Is it... Um, you know, problematic for development, social connections, uh, academic work, and so on. So that still interests me. So uh, I'm keeping, and then one final thing, perhaps I should say, and I've been writing a textbook, Psychology of Physical Activity, ever since uh, the 1990s. And um, uh, we're planning to continue that uh, into a fifth edition, um, maybe in the next few years, alongside of volume that's much more practical how do we apply this psychology so i think that's enough to keep me uh keep me going and wow alongside uh, visits to the golf course still, still at the <laughs> forefront and evolving because the world is evolving is that yeah. is that the textbook with nanette mutry yeah exactly ah, yeah with nanette yeah yeah so nanette's now retired still active of course in many ways and uh Trish Gawley and Guy Faulkner have been co-authors and we'll we'll see over the next year or so how how we'll take that forward but that's that's been a big sort of passion of mine over the years amazing well uh, Stuart thank you so much for talking to me today um just just a privilege to to hear you unpack but but simplify and open up some of these areas with with real consideration uh such a stellar career with an incredible contribution to the field uh so it's been humbling to to chat to you today i was very kind of you steve i really appreciate the uh, invitation i thoroughly enjoyed it really have thank you very much